Well, it, it's been a long time since this church was first started. 1909, everybody say, that's a long time ago. <laughs> 1909, the church uh, began, and so we celebrate 115 years together today. You know, things were a little bit different back in 1909 than they are today, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I just looked up a few things, even hard to get some accurate statistics on it, but the average annual wage in 1909 was $300. That was a year's salary, $300. William Taft was elected president that year. That year, the U.S. Navy began construction of Pearl Harbor, and that year, Henry Ford just had introduced the Model T automobile. It was $850 in 1909, which was like almost three years' salary it would have taken you to get one of those. Uh, I found it interesting that there were only about 8,000 cars in the U.S., and it's reported there were only about 144 miles of paved road in 1909. So things are a little different today uh, from then. But it's amazing to think that long of a history of God's faithfulness uh, to this particular local church. <laughs> of course, he's been faithful almost 2,000 years to the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as it was founded originally in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But God has been faithful and continues to do his work through the church and even here locally through this church. You know, if you go back, uh, here's just a few pictures of buildings from the church. This was, this was the first building constructed in 1911 here as the sanctuary at Lebanon Baptist Church. So uh, in one of the history uh, sections that I read about, it said that they decided to build this in the, at the beginning of August, and like by the third week of August, they had completed it. I don't know how accurate that is or not, but anyway, that's what it said in the notes. Oh, then after that, there was the second sanctuary that was uh, built and constructed, which is still standing over here. Uh, to my right, to your left, that was in 1955, and then this building was built in 1986, and you can see it uh, there, uh, 1986. Then again, we renovated this, uh, this building in 2019. I think there's a couple more pictures. This is some of the cool pictures of the building I thought was neat. Here's one. I think we may have one more just kind of overall of the church. Uh, but, you know, other buildings we have here on the building, classrooms and offices were added back here in 1970, the Fellowship Building in 1977, and then the Family Life Center in 2010. Uh, and again, that was has been instrumental these last 14 years. The Family Life Center has been hugely instrumental in us proclaiming the gospel to people that come through our ministries as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ there. We know the church, though, is not... The building. The church is not the building. Uh, in fact, I saw a, a picture this morning of a church in the western part of North Carolina of a building that was heavily damaged, uh, badly, uh, because of the uh, hurricane, and yet they had a, a white sheet hanging out that they had spray painted on it, service Sunday at 11 a.m. They're still meeting. I mean, you know, they're still going to meet. The church is not the building, the church is the people, but the buildings are necessary to do ministry. They are tools for us to use in getting the gospel out to our neighborhood and to the nations. The buildings are tools to be used to build up the body of Christ as we gather here together today and to facilitate the worship of our God. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes, um, some weeks, Monday through Saturday is tough and it's really hard. Uh, even in ministry, it can be that way. And uh, man, it is so refreshing and fulfilling to come in and to be reminded through the worship and through the reading of Scripture for why we are here and why we work and tirelessly as hard as we do. Why do we do the things that we do? And we're reminded of that and we encourage each other when we gather here in this building on Sundays. The buildings are tools for us to be used, for us to use them in the worship of God, the edifying of the saints and the reaching of the nations. But the church is the people. The church is the people. Now, what I want to do before we kind of get into the message today, I want to just kind of 
find out how long some of you have been at Lebanon Baptist Church. And so we're going to start like with the, with the newbies, okay, the newbies. And so I'm going to be asking you to stand up. You're going to have to think about this a little bit. You're going to have to do a little bit of math, all right? But what I'm asking first of all, though, is just for anybody who's been, you know, you've been regularly attending or you've been a member for five years or less, stand up, stand up, stand up. Five years or less, five years or less. I just want to kind of see this. Pretty cool. Yes, pretty cool. Oh, that's great. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. Now, we're going to go a little further than that, okay? We're going to go like, let's say, um, you've been here more than five years, but it's been not more than 10. So, 10, 6 to 10 years, something like that. I just want to get a feel for that. Stand up. 6 to 10 years. 6 to 10 years. How many people have been here in that, that, that amount of time? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right, you can be seated. Now, we're going to make a little bit bigger jump, okay? Just because I want to preach some scripture today, too. So we're going to make a little bit bigger jump. All right, so you've been, here, you've been here more than 10 years, but less than 25. So like between 10 to 25, that, that kind of number. Stand up. Look at that. Awesome. All right, you can be seated. All right, now we're going to make a little bit bigger jump. You've been here more than 25, but not more than 50. So you're like between years 6, 26 to, you've been here 26 to 50 years. Stand up. 26 to 50 years. Stand up. All right. Giving away your age just a little bit. <laughs> Except for some of you who were, you know, he, yeah, you, you were here from the womb, from the womb. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. You can be seated. All right, so that was through 50. Now we're going like, more than 50 years. Let's just go there. More than 50 years. Stand up. You've been here more than 50 years. Stand up. We're going to figure this out a little bit here. All right. <laughs> Stay standing. Stay standing, though. Stay standing. All right. Stay standing. Stay standing because you've been here more than 50 years. All right. Now, you, I want you to stay standing if you've been here more than 55 years. So 55 years or more. Stay standing. Everybody else be seated. All right. All right, you've been, here, you've been here 60 years or more, stay standing. 60 years or more, stay standing. 60 years, how many we got? We got two, just two, three? All right, okay, you've been here 70 years or more. Does that take y'all out? Just 70 years or more, not Alice? All right, I, I, I think I know this, but how many years have you been here? 72. Wow. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you. All right. Because I thought Alice was going to get the longest tenured. Okay. Uh, I want to show you their wedding photo. This is a photo from their wedding in that building over there when that was the, the church sanctuary. This was 1969. 1969. July 13th, anyway, some of their family there, and the pastor, yeah, we praise the Lord for that. Hey, one other thing, one other thing, so we got our, ki our kids up here today, uh, we have some serving in the nursery, but we have kids up here, so I want to see all that are up here who are under the age of 18, would y'all stand up, if you're under the age of 18, stand up, look at that. If they can't stand, you can kind of like hold them up like, <laughs> like Lion King, you know, like Lion King or something. But yeah, we are so glad to have you all up here with us. We are glad to have you a part of the church of Lebanon Baptist Church. You can be seated. Thank you. We are continuing in the book of Ephesians today. The book of Ephesians. I've titled today's message, The Church, A Demonstration of of God's grace, the church, a demonstration of God's grace. Um, Josh Treadway, who handles a lot of our graphics and putting together of the graphics for the uh, sermon, PowerPoints and slides, he texted me earlier in the week and said, are you 
going to be preaching a special message Sunday? And I said, yes. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. <laughs> it doesn't get any more special than this passage of Scripture, really. It doesn't. I, I thought it couldn't get any better than chapter 1, 3 through 14. It may, it may rival that here, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It's a beautiful text of Scripture. This is really the third section in Ephesians, and in this section, Paul, as Tommy has read for us, contrasts the, the past and present state of believers to tell us what we were apart from Christ, but what we now are because of God's work for us and placing us in Christ. I mean, he shows us the dramatic change that has taken place in the realm of what God has done for us, and he tells us why God has done this for us. And so today, as we're going to look at these verses of Scripture, we're going to look at what we were apart from Christ, what God did for us, and then what we are now. And that answers why God has done it and shows us what we are to be and to do. And I think it gives us a very clear vision for what we are to be uh, for the future. So first, let's look at what we were. It's verses 1 through 3. And if you're taking notes, we're just going to look at the simple outline today with three points and a few sub points under each point and, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, first we're going to look at what we were, what we were. Look at verses 1 through 3, and you were what? And you were dead. dead. You were dead in your trespasses. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom, what does Paul say? We all, among, he includes himself, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That is what we were before Christ. If you're here today or you're watching this online and you are not a believer yet, you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this is still true of you. But for those of you that have put your faith and trust in Jesus, this is a past reality for you. This is what we all were. You know, it doesn't get any worse than that. We were, what is it? Look at the person beside you and say, that is not good. <laughs> that is not good. We were spiritually dead. We were separated from God. Just like physical death means separation from the person to the body, spiritual death means separation of the person from God. We were dead, Paul says, in our trespasses and sins. Trespasses deals with deviating from the right thing. It, trespasses deals with deviating from the truth, turning from the right path, you know, trespasses is you're driving down the road, you do something like look at your phone and you drive and run off the road. You deviated from the right path. Sins deals with missing the mark. Those are the two words that he uses, trespasses and sins. Sins deals with missing the mark. It was used in classical Greek of a spearman who would throw a spear at a target, but it would fall short of the target. And so one means we don't hit the mark we're supposed to, and the other means we actually go in the direction we're not supposed to. Romans 3 says, we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. We missed the mark. We were dead. We could do nothing on our own to come alive. Uh, Romans 5, 12 says, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. It doesn't get any worse than this. I was talking to a pastor some years ago who was an older pastor, a seasoned pastor, and he said to me, we were talking about evangelism, and he said that in his years of ministry experience, many Christians had said to him that they were fearful oftentimes of sharing the gospel with a lost person because they were afraid that they would mess things up. You know, I might say something that will make it worse. And he said, I always just encourage them, lost people are dead in their sins. You can't make it any worse. It doesn't get any worse than this. like Carolina football, it just doesn't get any 
any worse than this. This is an awful, this is really an awful reality. But not only were we dead, he goes on and says, not only were we dead, we were also disobedient. He says we were children of disobedience in verse 2. Literally, the spirit of the devil was at work in us, causing us to disobey God. In other words, before Christ, we thought and acted the same way that the devil thinks and acts. Because we were children of his. We had his evil nature and character. Uh, You know, if you have kids or you've had kids or you work with kids, you realize that children are disobedient by nature. You don't have to teach them to be disobedient. They are disobedient by nature. Uh, Friday, we were uh, just on a little short walk uh, down a trail to a, uh, to a lake, to a little lake or pond, and all, all seven of us were walking, and uh, my wife was nervous about copperhead snakes, and so she was telling Anna, our three-year-old little girl, not to be the first one. Let me go first. I, you know, let me go first. You don't walk on the path first. Let me go first. And Anna was just looking back at her and laughing and running on ahead of her. And I was in the very back kind of chuckling, you know, watching her try to get up in front of her. And then her, it was just kind of a funny thing. But they, by nature, by nature, they want to disobey, run ahead, do what they're told not to do and laugh about it. One of their first words is no. And it, it comes in the context of when you tell them to do something. No. That was us with respect to God. But it wasn't cute because it was following the spirit of the enemy, deserving of God's wrath. It gets a little worse than this. We were dead. We were disobedient. In the third D, we were, Paul says, we were doomed. It says that we were, by nature, the children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. You know, the wrath of God is a prominent theme in Scripture that we don't talk about a whole lot. Kyle referenced some of the wrath of God, even as God's grace was on display there in Genesis chapter 6. But you go back throughout the Scripture, there were many who perished in the flood of Noah. They faced the wrath of God, the just wrath of God. Sodom and Gomorrah faced the wrath of God, the just wrath of God. The children of Israel, the people of Israel, they disobeyed God. And he had told them that if they did that, they would be punished. They would suffer his wrath. And he sent other nations in to conquer them as he poured out his just wrath on them. John the Baptist, in his preaching in the, in the New Testament, he said to the people that he preached to flee from the coming wrath of God. Even in John 3, 16, where we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means apart from believing in Christ, you're going to face perishing. You're going to face the just wrath of God. And Romans 1, 18 says, The wrath of God has been revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness. There is no gospel apart from the wrath of God, the just wrath of God, being poured out on sinful humanity. We deserve it. We were dead in our sins. We were disobedient to God. John Phillips put it like this, We were without God, without Christ, without hope. We were sinners by birth, by choice, and by practice. Our lot was cast in a world controlled by the evil one, and our eternal destiny was to live forever under God's wrath and curse. That is what Paul says. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And we're out of time, so we'll just stop there. Is this one time you want me to keep going? Maybe, perhaps. I hope so anyway. That wouldn't make for a good homecoming anniversary service, would it? God, you're so good.
we come in verse 4 now to the greatest two words in all of Scripture, the strongest contrast in the whole Bible, the shortest expression of the gospel, but God. I mean, this is what we were, but God. Let's look at what God did when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, disobedient to him, following the prince of the power of this world, doomed. God, being rich in mercy, full of love, stepped in and did something about it. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, just in case we forgot verse 1, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And in case we missed it, he repeats it, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Look at what God did for us. He loved us, the text says, with a great love, verse 4. He was rich in mercy, but it was because of the great love with which he loved us. He loved us. It wasn't just that he was full of love, he actually loved us personally. His love acted on our behalf, stepped in. We became the precious recipients and objects of his love, even when we were dead, disobedient, and doomed. Not only does it tell us that he loved us, but secondly, it tells us that he regenerated us. That's a word you ought to know. Regeneration. Regeneration. Everybody say regeneration. regeneration. Okay. Verse 5, that is the work of regeneration in verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, here's the work, made us alive together. For God to regenerate us, it means that he made us alive. He, he caused us to be born again. This is the act of regeneration. When God imparts life to the one who believes, the act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us, Regeneration means to be born again. It's throughout the scripture, John 1, 12, and 13. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is the spiritual birth. In John 3, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I think this one was read earlier, Titus 3, verse 5. He, God, saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is entirely the work of God. Do you see it in verse 5? Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Together? Who's the one doing the work? God. With Christ. By grace, you have been saved. It's a divine passive in the Greek text. Meaning that the you is not the one doing the work. It's receiving the work that God is doing for you. God's initiative resounds throughout this text. I love what one person, how one author put it, we can neither arrange to be born nor to be born again. I didn't arrange my birth. I didn't arrange my new birth. This is the work of God in loving us, regenerating us. Salvation is neither initiated by human effort nor is it a reward for human good deeds how could it be when we are dead, controlled by the world, the evil powers, and the flesh, and we are headed to suffer divine wrath? William Temple once wrote, all of this, all is of God. The only thing, I, listen to this, listen to this, don't miss this. William Temple, 
He said, all is of God. The only thing of my very own which I can contribute to redemption is the sin from which I need to be redeemed. Please don't miss that. The only thing of my very own which I can contribute to my redemption is the sin from which I need to be redeemed. God has loved us. He has regenerated us. He resurrected us, it says in verse 6. He raised us up together with Christ. And then, lastly, he empowered us. Verse 6, he made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, it's very interesting in verse 5 where it says he made us alive. And then in verse 6, he raised us up with Christ and he seated us with Christ. All three of these things are the exact same things that were said that God did literally, physically of Jesus in chapter 1. Remember in chapter 1 where we are told, what is the immeasurable, verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Those are the things he has done for us as well, the same three, raised us up, empowered us, made us alive together. The idea here is that God has made us joint heirs with Jesus, sharers in the dignity that Christ has. We are citizens of a new country, citizens of heaven. What God has done for us spiritually is all pictured in what he did for Christ physically. Christ died physically, we were dead spiritually. And so Christ was raised physically, we were made alive and raised spiritually. Christ is seated now in the heavenly realms, And it is said here of us that God has seated us with him. It's already been done. Seated us with him in the heavenly realms. What God did for us is he saved us by his grace. He saved us by his grace. Now I want to get to what I really want to get to. The third point, this is what we now are. And this gives us the vision for what we are to be, what we are. Look at the third point, what we are, verses 7 and 10. What does it say, the purpose for all of this? Why did God do all of this? Well, here's one reason in verse 7. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Man, Paul is just, he is... His vocabulary is extensive. He just continues upon word after word and embellishing upon this. It rings a little bit of a bell for us if we go back to verse 19 of chapter 1. There he spoke of the immeasurable greatness of God's power to us who believe. Now he speaks of the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us. In Christ Jesus. We are his riches. Like you are the prize of God that he bought with a heavy, heavy price. The blood of his own son, the death of his own son, Jesus. I mean, think about that. This is what you are in Christ. You are the riches of God, the prized possession of God that he put his own son to death on the cross for to be able to have. And the text says that forever, yes, now, but even in the coming ages, we will forever be the objects of his kindness on display before all of the angelic world and everything in the cosmos, basking in the sunshine of God's smile, enjoying the riches of his blessings so that he can be glorified through it. Look at what I have done. Why has God done all of this for us? One, to get glory for himself. But secondly, look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Courtney said it well in the video interview. 
that yes, faith in Christ is what we need. God's salvation is all we need to get into heaven. But he hasn't saved us to just wait till that day and do nothing. He has saved us to make a difference. He has saved us for good works. He has created us as a new creation in Christ Jesus. He has done all of this for us as a result of his grace. And even his grace extends to the point that he has prepared good works for us to do now to demonstrate his grace to the world. This idea of being God's workmanship means to be his work of art, his masterpiece. Our lives are the canvases with which God is painting a picture of his grace and mercy. Someone has said you may be the only Bible that some people read. You are that canvas the way that you live out these good works that God has prepared for you as a result of his grace, the way that you do that is you are showing a demonstration to the world of God's grace and mercy, of the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward you. We are his masterpiece. We are his new creation. God is still creating. He's creating new life in believers. And so we are his riches. We are his masterpiece. We are his new creation but we are also his vessels. We are the vessels that God wants to use to do good works through. God has prepared these good works to accomplish through us even before we were saved. And although our salvation is not of works, the outcome of it is for works. Good works are not the root of our salvation, but they are the fruit of our salvation. God has not saved us because of our good works. He has saved us for the purpose of doing good works. Now that we belong to God, God is working on us and in us so that we might demonstrate his grace as he works through us as his vessel. You know, the, the first song, the first song that we were uh, singing, or I don't know if it was the first one, we were singing the song, might have been the second, How Great Thou Art. I was just overwhelmed thinking about this particular aspect of what God has, is doing, that he's using us, and just overwhelmed as I'm singing to think about how great God is, that in spite of me, his grace is still at work in and through me, just as a vessel to be used to accomplish his plans and purposes, to get glory for himself, and to demonstrate his grace to the world, and I'm just humbled by that this morning. As a Christian, you do not do what you do to earn favor with God. You do what you do because you have received favor with God. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You notice he started off in verse 1 saying we were walking, in verse 2 rather, we were walking following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And now he says, because of God's grace, you are to walk in a different kind of walk. You're to walk in good works. Before, in verses 1 through 3, anything that could be said of what we did would not be good. It'd be the opposite. Now he says, you were walking in good works. You know, if we desire, I was just thinking, if we desire to continue to be a church, we must be a church that works. You know, just in eight years, there are many, many times and many weeks I feel exhausted by the amount of work that goes on here at our church and what we do. And there are a lot of times where I'm tempted to try to scale this thing back dramatically <laughs> because it is hard, it is tiring. But yet, God has a purpose for us, and that purpose is not to just sit and do nothing. It is to work for him, so thereby demonstrating his grace to us, to the world. That's what we're to do. Uh, someone, I was just in a meeting, I think Monday, with some other pastors, and one, one guy who was not a pastor, but had been a pastor before, is working with North Carolina Baptist, he made this statement. He said, the church is the best thing God has given to the world right now. And, you know, we, in light of everything that's been happening in Western North Carolina, that thought resonated with me. Someone I just saw 
kind of a, a, an observer posted on Facebook this week and said, this past week there has been a common theme of whom we can count on. Churches and religious organizations. And they said, if you've been on the fence, I pray the actions will speak to your heart. Those that serve and work and, and do good works for God, they are demonstrating God's grace to the world, the grace that they have received. I'm going to leave a lot of people out. I'm going to try not to call any names here, but there are some just recent things that have happened where people in our church have been working and serving, doing good works as God's workmanship that God has prepared for them to demonstrate his grace. Many of you, many of you brought food and water to fill the trailer for victims in Western North Carolina this past week, and we, we took the whole trailer down on Thursday filled with stuff to drop off to give to them. Nine, there may have been more, but at least nine men from our church were up there this week working in Boone and in the surrounding area. There were men over here yesterday serving, doing the good work of setting that tent up for, we, for us to enjoy something a little different today as we go out and we can eat outside under that tent. That was a little bit of work to put up. And there were men over here doing that just yesterday to get us ready for that. Even just yesterday evening, many of our youth and youth leaders were serving a meal last night as we celebrated with some of our church family and some friends and family for Dan and Connie as they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, which we congratulate them for. And we congratulate our youth and youth leaders who are here serving. Then they also served last night to set up the tables and chairs to get ready for today. Today, many will be serving food and working and doing all of that. They'll be doing the good work of cleaning up, tearing down, putting away. Last night, we had three men that were here like all night long smoking the barbecue chicken for us today. Like all night, like camped out to do that so that we can have good, I, I hear it's better when it, it takes a while to cook. And so they were and I tried to save this for toward the end of the message, but it sounds like it's going to be good, okay? But that was last night, just last night, even into the morning. I heard one of them went home at 3 a.m., tapped out, had to go home at 3 a.m. <laughs> but still, at least two families, there's probably more, at least two families this week received a meal from a lady in our church this week to take to them, to be a blessing to them. At least one man in our church helped another man in our church who had an accessibility need at his home for his mom who's been in a nursing home and unable to walk now and needs some help. And one man in our church went to try to assess and figure out how he can help. Last week, another man in our church called me about a need that another man in our church had and within a few hours had met that need. Some this week were working to restock our food pantry for October 26th when we'll serve our community through that. Some this week were out visiting shut-ins from our church, walking in the good works that God had prepared for them. Some ladies in our church, they meet consistently and regularly to make cough pillows to be given to cancer patients in hospitals during their time of need. Right now, there are some downstairs doing the good work of working and serving in the nursery. Usually there's about 30 volunteers on a Sunday that do the work in our kids' ministry of teaching and, and leading and keeping the nursery. Right now, several are in the back doing the good works of running the AVL and the live stream and all that goes into that. There's so many ministries. You heard DJ uh, talk on the video uh, about the ministry of re-engage and how that helped them uh, early on here. And, and there are some that do the good work of participating in and serving through that ministry. I just had lunch with a man this past week who's only been coming here for just a few weeks, and he told me about how he was greatly helped by the discussion in their life group recently. And there are so many each week that prepare to lead life groups or teach Sunday school classes, and they're doing the good works that were created, they were created to do, that God had prepared for them, demonstrating the grace of God. There are so many ways 
a worship team that practices and spends time preparing and coming in early and staying on Wednesday nights and the safety team that work throughout the, the, the time when we're having services and those that serve in our child enrichment center and our upward volunteers and youth volunteers and kids ministry volunteers. We want to be not the best church in the community. We want to be the best church for the community. We want to be a church for the community. And though our methods continue to change, the message of the gospel doesn't change. I mean, you, you look and reflect back at the years, just recent years, 50 years or so. I think some of the video footage that showed up on the screen there, there was an image of Mr. Woody up here somewhere up in this area, probably, and he was praying over the service. And that was, I think, in 1988 when you saw that. And though things look a little bit differently and those styles of worship change a little bit over time, though our methods change a little bit over time, who would have imagined 50 years ago the impact of getting the gospel out through sports ministry like we have? Though the methods continue to change, the message of the gospel doesn't change. We preach Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, buried and raised again in salvation through faith in him. And though the culture around us changes continually, our reason for being remains the same. We are the recipients of God's grace so that we can be the demonstration of God's grace. I'm going to close with three examples, and I'm done. So this past week, just to illustrate, this past week, uh, when we, a group of us, about eight of us, were up in, in Boone Thursday, and one of the places we were sent to go to, we were just told, go to this address, there's a guy there named Mark, where we heard he needs help. It was a pastor of a local church there said, go to his house. We had dropped off the supplies. We had done something. We repaired a driveway that had washed out. And then we were said, go to this guy. It was north of West Jefferson. Go to this guy named Mark. He needs help. So we get there. And um, we got shovels and mud boots and buckets. Because we were told there's mud that needs to be gotten out of his house. And so we get there. And um, nobody has been yet. This is Thursday. Nobody has been to help him. He's um, got a pacemaker and doesn't need to be doing some of the things that he's doing. No equipment, no shovels, no nothing. Uh, their entire first floor had been flooded up to eight feet of water. Uh, there was about a foot of deep of mud on the back patio, a lot of mud on the inside, and it was just unlike anything you've seen before. When we first got there, the first person I met was... Uh, his teenage or, or you know, 20-year-old um, son, um, whose uh, one of the first words was an explicative. <laughs> the, the woman uh, said she was not a person of faith, you know, didn't really believe in that kind of thing. Uh, her mom had been down in the house when the water came in and got about waist high. They had to go in in the middle of the night to get her out of that room to bring her upstairs. She was asleep, didn't know anything was happening. Um, so, but they were so thankful, so grateful that we would come in and do that and just help shovel all of that out and try to help them. And I'm telling you, the, uh, the disaster of that is unimaginable when it's been sitting there like it has for that long, um, among other things. And, but at the very end, we're getting ready to go, and I was with Mark, and there was another man or two on our team that was there, and I just said to him, I said, you know, hey, Mark, listen, we, like, we don't know you. We just met you. We came from Greensboro. We love you because God has loved us. Is it okay if I pray with you, right? I just asked him if I could pray with him, and then I share the gospel in my prayer. Like, that was how I've worked it and get that gospel message in there, and just pray that they will come to see and receive the grace of God as we try to demonstrate that grace, unmerited favor. The wife uh, that was not a person of faith, she came over and just thanked us tremendously before we left. We made it clear we were through the church, 
from a church, gave them the contact of the pastor that had sent us. We have something to do, church. We have something to do. God has prepared for us to walk in these good works. He has not saved us and given us his grace so that we can do nothing. He has done this so that we can do the good works he has prepared for us to do to demonstrate his grace to the world. I found this interesting, and I want to share it with you. Example number two. This was a letter written to the church from the pastor here in 1968. And I was reading it, and I thought, you know, that really captures well something that needs to be expressed today. And so I'm going to read it to you. It's like, this, by the way, this man pastored here for over 32 years, and 90 years of age, just passed away a few weeks ago, and is buried out here in the cemetery. But pastored here for 32 years. In 1968, this was the letter that was written to the church, and, and I just think it's so fitting. Here's what it says. Dear member of Lebanon Baptist Church, you perhaps have never realized your importance as a member of this Christian organization. Without you, the Sunday school and the various other groups, it would be impossible for the church to carry on this worthwhile ministry in this community. Without you, your interest and enthusiasm, financial giving and faithful attendance to all regular services, there would soon be no church called Lebanon. You are a member of a Baptist church that is involved in the greatest spiritual endeavor in all the world, reaching others with the gospel of Christ. The goal of every organization within our church is committed to the task of making Christ known. You being a member of this church means that you intend to support all the worship services unless providentially hindered to seek to have your life measure up to the Christian standards found in the Bible and the church covenant and to seek to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. It is my desire to be a genuine pastor and friend to you when you're confronted with troubles and sorrows. These are mine also. When you experience personal illness or that of your family, please let me know. You have many other fellow members. These are members of your family in the Lord, as Leon mentioned. Love them, pray for them, and be faithful to meet with them regularly. I trust we shall have a fruitful ministry together in our church and that we shall grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and shall have a victorious life for our Lord. Your pastor, Carl Carl Shelton, he was the pastor at the time. It's the spirit of that that I hope to convey today. Last thing I'll say, I got an email. I got an email yesterday from a 12-year-old girl in our church. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but the email says the damage, hi Pastor Matt, the damage Hurricane Helene has caused has really been pulling at my heart. I wanted to start a diaper and wipe drive at church in my school. Would you be open to sending an email to the church families? My family and I can take responsibility for collecting, keeping track of, and making sure the donations get to Western North Carolina through organizations like BaptistOnMission.org, Red Cross, or Samaritan's Purse, in Christ, and then she signed her name. Absolutely, we can do that. I'll send an email out because I said I would, but I'm telling you, like, we're going to do this, okay? 12 years old. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? As the worship team comes to prepare to, cl- to, to lead us in a closing hymn about the faithfulness of God, he has been faithful to us. Will we be faithful to him? If we desire to be a church to continue in this community as a demonstration of the grace of God, if we desire to be that kind of church, 
we got to commit ourselves to be faithful to him as he has been faithful to us. we got to realize that we're not saved by our good works, but we've been saved by God for good works. And so we've got to stay busy for Jesus Christ, demonstrating God's grace to the world as long as we have opportunity to do so. No matter our age or stage of life, there is something for us to do in service to Christ here. And it's my prayer that we'll continue to do it. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on us. When we were dead, disobedient, and doomed, you, you, Lord, you not only made a way, uh, you saved us. You made us your riches. You gave us new life you raised us up you seated us with Christ made us joint heirs with him and and then you have not just taken us on to 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 be in heaven immediately but you have left us here for a purpose one day we will for eternity be a display of the immeasurable riches of of your grace in kindness towards us but now we're to be a demonstration of the riches of your kindness, of your grace and kindness to us. And so, Father, help us to, to, to be that and to do that. Why have you done all of this for us, God, for your glory, but also so that we can be used for the saving, proclaiming of the gospel to many more who yet remain and need to hear about Christ and need to understand your grace and love for them. And so, Father, it is that task that we pray that you would motivate us to and you would equip us to as we respond to your grace for us. If Christ doesn't return for another 115 years, may we still be found faithful. May the faithfulness of past generations that we have celebrated and, and honored some here today, may that be said of us in the future, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now. Lord, I pray if Christ hasn't returned that some of our pictures and videos would appear as a testimony to your faithfulness to us and to our faithfulness to you. And this we pray for in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.